So now the role concept, um, the one I got the EBMA for, and I, f I felt stroke when Munich Junison said Schmidt may GA really organizational. So that's not absolutely true. We are still on the way too. <laughs> but it, it's a step too. I have to say you look younger now than you do there. I look younger, younger now? now than you do there. Uh, good. <laughs> 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 Maybe I'm on my way back. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, the three worlds, I will uh, say what role model of personality is, and I showed you just in the beginning the graphic of uh, the three world models that is a role model, only divided in roles in three worlds, and you can use it as a personality model, saying your personality is the roles you play on the stages of your life, and there is no other personality. So this is an idea uh, from Eric Byrne. What counts is real life, not your mystification, what you could be. In, in German there is a saying, is that I'm really totally different, but I don't have, to time, don't have time to live it. <laughs> <coughs> So this is what you really live, and uh, you can use it as a personality model, and you also can use it as a functional model for communication. From which roles are you addressing another person in encounter, and which roles are you activating? So it's as well a, a personality point of view as a encounter point of view. So, the role concept is an expansion of the ego state model, and it can be used like the ego state model. I will not show everything how you do it, only some examples, but all the, um, the thinking procedures you have learned for ego states, you can just use with roles as well. So you don't have to learn a total new system. I will give you examples for a sec. And it's a personality model and a communication model at the same time. According to the definition of ego states, I define the role as a coherent system of attitudes, feelings, and behaviors. You know that from ego states, and then perspective on reality, that's a systemic point coming in, and the accompanying relationships. So with each role, if you think it in a play, it's interactional. So each role implicates an idea of relationships to other roles, or relationships to place. So that's a definition uh, that implicates the context. And uh, the ego state model doesn't implicate context. You remember Graham Barth's uh, words saying, TA will die because it's not able to deal with content and context. I think it's possible to deal with content and context, and we have to enlarge our concepts to make that possible. As we had it already on the theater metaphor, the theater metaphor is an additional way to deal with the role model. Uh, personality, personality is understood as a portfolio. And a port, uh, you, you 
uh, in the theater metaphor, I said you can start from stages, portfolio of stages or portfolio of styles. Uh, theater met metaphor came later than the role model. When I uh, worked with the role model, it's 20 years ago. Uh, the theater metaphor wasn't there. So we started everything from the roles and then, oh, there's not only roles, there's stages and all these things. So the roles, you are the roles played on the stages of your worlds. So the question is, which are your worlds you live in? So your reality bubbles. And your uniqueness as a human being can be expressed in the way you play your roles, not beside your roles. Uh, people in, in organizations often think they have to play a role because society is expecting this role, and then there are human beings besides that, their characters besides that. And this is a didactic step to say, no, it's not besides that. It's the way you play your roles, that's your unique personality, there is no other one. I was, um, on Sunday I was out and um, I was talking to this lady and I said, oh yeah, I was here next week. And I said what I was doing. Not loud and sorry. slowly, please. <laughs> I was talking to a lady on Sunday about being here this week. Yes. And, um, and she said, oh really, what are you doing? So I told her and she went, well, surely when you go to work for a company, you're told what your role is going to be. Mm -hmm. And it really struck me and I thought, gosh, yes, people do think that, you know, here's your job description, yeah. here you yeah. go, off you go, yeah. and in fact, actually, that's such a, well, probably even a lot of the time, that's not it at all. Yes. I mean, I know my job description does not fit what I do at all. So, it's just a contract that outlines my, my mm -hmm. pay. <laughs> yeah. And, and so that's a thinking pattern problem. Yeah. If you think a unique personality is one thing, and roles are another thing, then you always have the problems of fitting them together. Mm -hmm. If you think it differently and say, uniqueness means the way I play my roles, then it's together by definition. So you mean style here, yeah, really. With number three, you mean style. The way I play my roles, my style. Yeah, it's not only style. More than style. Yeah, it's, uh, it's the themes I have, the stories I bring in with that. It's, it's not only the style. That's, it's, uh, I was thinking with this um, that so many people make a split between yeah. personality right. and roles. It is very parallel to the split that many people make between body and mind. Right. The Descartian right. split. Right. Right. Absolutely. Um, and so this is a, a scientific tradition in Germany. Mm -hmm. When I when I first published the role model, I, I got nasty comments yeah. in saying this person doesn't know what a role is. A role are the expectations of society. I said, yeah, that's the one way you can state roles, but then you have the problems we always have between mm -hmm. roles and personality. I, I change the definition and say role is the way I live my life in society. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and in, in a way, that reframes entirely how we develop, because if we think like that, there's no need to think at all that our childhoods shape how we are now. Mm -hmm. So that's very challenging to a lot of yeah, traditional it's not ways of thinking, I imagine. Yes. And it's not, not automatically bringing in childhood no. uh, or biography. It's not necessary to That's consider right. about it's quality of roles media. and quality of life today. I've noticed that um, when I introduce this idea to many people in TA, they will not accept it. Mm -hmm. Yes. Because the ideas of personality are so strong. Yes. And I notice even people that you've trained yeah. will tell me, well, maybe, you know, he draws personality in the middle, so maybe he sees personality, you see personality as somehow deep inside there is a personality. Mm -hmm. wow. Yeah. 
So they, they made a compromise between yeah, the role model yeah, and the old yeah, model. Because it's so hard in our yeah. cultures. We are so personality oriented in this. Yeah, we, and we have the idea of a core yeah. uh, that is beside our real life. Yeah. And Eric Burns said, uh, it's all we work about is real life situations and real people. I'm not sure. Did he ever talk about a, a core personality behind that? No. I don't think he did. No, that's, that's also quite an individualist notion, I think, the idea of a core personality. Mm. And, and this basically suggests that our personality is socially constructed. No, not only. You, not. Uh, you also can see there is a, 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 an essence, but it, it's in the how. It's not somewhere beside. So. Your essence is brought into the world by playing your roles in a unique way and not being unique besides playing your roles. And certainly in organizations there are roles who give a lot of space to bring your uniqueness into it and there are roles do not, which do not offer much space. Mm -hmm. you know? That's the reality. I don't think you can change all roles because of your uniqueness. And that's a compromise. You have to accept all the rules of the place your role is designed for and understand your role and the place. You can place your role when you don't understand the play. And still, still do it in your own unique way and find out how, how that can uh, happen and uh, where there are ways to do that not uh, but still playing your role that because other people uh, 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 should rely on rules you uh, you accept the rules of your role otherwise it's too complicated to arrange place so it's it's a a balance question. Can I can I ask? Well, I'm just trying to work through something with with a client actually, who um, he comes to me for supervision, and the piece he bought recently was he's a facilitator coach, mm -hmm. and most of his work is in that field, um, and he loves that. But he had taken on some work where it was actually much more of a training role. And the training had to be given in a certain way mm -hmm. by the organization telling him. And his dilemma was that he was trying to facilitate coach yes. in the training. And yes. the company said, no, yes. you know, you're, not, you're not good at this. Mm -hmm. um, and it made me think about roles, that he was trying to be in a role that actually somehow on the stage he couldn't play. That's what I mean. right. He couldn't be. Right. that... Yeah, it, when you think about bargaining with a company, you could use this language yeah. uh, to bargain. Yeah. But if uh, if there is a, uh, they define a play and the roles and the style in their way, and you not accept that your ideas of style, role, and so on, uh, has a, a place here, then yeah. it's not a dilemma. Yeah. It's not really a dilemma. <laughs> it's only you have to pay the price for not playing that role. Yeah. <laughs> A dilemma is uh, if there's whatever you decide, there's no real solution. There is a solution to that. Unless the, pe the person thinks he or she would starve not taking this role or constructs the dilemma by saying, if I do not adapt, then I have even greater problems. But when I adapt, then I also have big problems no matter what I decide it's a problem, then the person constructs a dilemma out of a decision situation. And that's a mental, usually a mental problem in, in our society. Because um, uh, the idea that the person cannot afford just not to play a role that the person doesn't like uh, is a mental question. Usually, they just do not want to pay the price for freedom. Mm -hmm. But we are now going into the content levels. We, uh, we have a lot of work to do just to, to, to build up this theoretical construction first.
I just want to just I'm um, just I'm a little bit stuck on the first one. Yeah. And the reason I'm stuck on it is because I'm thinking of the chicken and the egg. And <coughs> I'm not sure. I, I guess I've missed I've misunderstood the, the. I understand the others, and I understand the theatre, and yeah. I understand the roles and the plays I, and the styles yeah. and stages and you yeah. know the scenery. But that's not a statement about right, okay. reality. It's yeah. a it's a didactic statement. Right, okay. Let let's look at it from this point of view, yeah. and we have different question. And because the other point of view is much more common, yeah. and brings us to a lot of limitations. Mm -hmm. And certainly, uh, there are many situations when we can turn this around yeah. and use uh, the classical view on personality, and then compare. What would the question be different if we look <laughs> from the classical point of view, and when we look from the role? Point of view, which which version will give us more freedom uh, to develop? I'm not. Uh, all my statements. Remember, I said uh, systemic thinking is means models are not answers, but are ways to ask the question. So. Now I give you s just uh, I, I, uh, I mentioned some uh, classical TA figures how you can use them with role concept for example role fix fixation instead of ego state fixation. You all know people who cannot change roles. You can say ego state, but you cannot change roles. And when you sit together with them on a dinner table, they are still supervising you. <laughs> Doesn't find that don't find the exit of that role. Uh, the role exclusions. Uh, all of you have examples of uh, professionals who get head of an department, but not really play the head role. They also always they go on playing the professional colleague role. Yeah, not really taking their job. And so the, it's a, a role exclusion, maybe of not being informed that a uh, role change is necessary, maybe of motivated by being re relaxing to use power that is going with specific roles, whatever. And role confusion, so that uh, if the head of the department is psychologist, and one of the coaches, employee coaches, is also psychologist. If they discuss uh, which could be the right strategy to develop products, they can mix up all the time uh, opinions as professionals, and who has to say in the end what the strategy is to develop products. And if that is mixed up all the time, they sometimes do not really know what they are talking about and what what they are uh, bargaining on. And you know, and uh, ego states confusion, you know as well. So, okay. So, role model just is saying uh, as a conception of a personality as a portfolio of roles. And I came up with uh, three roles ego state model, uh, role model, saying uh, it makes sense for many purposes to divide uh, the area of profession and organizations into the profession part and the organizational part. For example, for supervision, the question, if you if somebody comes in and says, "I want to have supervision for being uh, a leader," I want to develop the profession, or let's say a coach. I want to develop my under, self understanding, my identity as a coach, knowing everything a, co a coach should know. 
then you have a different uh, priority in supervising these persons from the background of the profession coach, as if the same person comes in and says, actually, I'm a coach in this and that company, in these and that projects, and I need supervision for acting within uh, within this organizational context. Then the focus is on ro the organizational role the person is in now, and may be even from the profession, it's a coach, in the organizational context, uh, it might be a group leader at that time. So it's not a, it's not a coach job, it's, it's a coach profession behind, but the actual job, uh, organizational role, might be a project leader. And the questions uh, I have to ask myself, what do, what do I have to know and to do to be a good project leader, are the same questions as if I have, would be an economist or an IT manager or whatever in that organizational role. And so it's good really uh, to decide whether it's an organizational supervision or it's a professional supervision. And there are different contexts coming in when you, if you uh, refer to the organizational uh, world, then the organizational organization is the context and the markets and fields the organization is in. And you have to have somehow a, a clarified relationship to all these things in order to know your role in the organization. If you think about as a professional role or overall as coach, there's a different context coming in. It's a training context, it's a coaching market, there are the developments in uh, the economical field and the possible jobs for coaches, the, contribu the associations for coaching, the contributions of individual coaches or associations to the development of society and all these things. So it's uh, different worlds, they, t they come together in a specific situation and you can look at the same control problem from your organizational role and from your professional role, but it invites different backgrounds and different hierarchies to focus on, to learn more. And the private world is uh, it's everything between family and society. Günther Mohr uh, said it's important for his focusing that the uh, community world is separate from the small private world. Mm -hmm. And again, this is only a didactic model. Yeah, if you have the need to. S to put things together because the difference doesn't make a difference right now. Then your professional world and organizational world can be in one category. Or if you have the need to make differences, more differences that make a difference, reasons, a uh, way to define uh, uh, information, difference that makes a difference. I, I guess you know everybody. Uh, then the organizational world can be split up into customers organizations, organizations I am in, personally. Right. Um, are you able to leave these chairs a bit more out of the way? Sorry. Just she needed a strong man. <laughs> <laughs> That's em emancipation. <laughs> Not to feel entitled <laughs> to use your own hands. <laughs> yeah, or the professional world, when you are in different professions, it might make sense to split it up. When you are a psychotherapist on the one hand, and you're turning yeah. into to being a coach on the other hand, it might make sense uh, to differentiate to differentiate between uh, these parts of the world. Mm. 
And it's good to differentiate because they have different logics. The field, the professional field of psychotherapy has different contexts, different rules, different, different criteria how to organize yourself in a qualified way than the, the world of organizational coaching. And then it's really important to split that and know and, and be aware in which professional part of yourself you are right now. And especially in, in the TA field, but also in the coaching and other fields, uh, this is not taken very seriously. So the kind of logics of reality are mixed up all the time between psychotherapeutic uh, uh, professionality and other professionalities. And I hope to, to help with concepts like this uh, to make more differences that really make a difference for oneself and for society and not naively uh, transferring reality logics from one field to another field. In, in TA terms, uh, roles, the role model is a functional model. In TA you have a structure and function. Structure means personality structure in terms of biography. And we don't have something uh, in the role model like that. We just don't have it. It's just a functional model. Don't you think there's a place in the role model for uh, biography of all the different roles I've played, that the roles I play now? Um, are impacted by what I've learned in the yes. previous role. Not in the model. It's an additional perspective. It's an additional. It's not part of. It's not a definitory part of the model, yeah. but certainly an, uh, sometimes a very important question. Yeah. But it's not automatically included in the model. And in TA, by connecting yeah. functional model with structural model, it's automatically included. Yeah. Get you. So this model is connecting person with the world. You can, do, uh, if you look at it, you cannot really define a person without a context, without the world in which this person is living. And so y you don't have to transfer the question, how can this person live in this world? Because this person is conceptualized as somebody playing her roles in her worlds. It's an undividable part of, li of life. And what I already said, uh, the differences in this model can be changed um, relating on your focus. What you want to make, look at it different, dif in a differentiated way, you differentiate. And what you, what is the difference they are not important right now, you just the differentiate that you don't have to complicate a model. So it's a it's it's a flexible, adaptable way of working with models. The model is not always transporting a lot of quest, uh, questions or region that I wanted to, to answer with with the model. And this we we still have this in TA. So you all know the conventional functional model, um, and it's mm -hmm. limited to specific categories because it's still tied in with the structural model, and the structural model is threefold. It hasn't been all the time threefold. In the beginning, it was twofold, for example. One of uh, I don't know whether I have it here. No, one of the first. Uh, models of Eric Byrne in the e uh, intuition and ego states is a lawyer and uh, he had a vision of a lawyer and a boy. So he made two bubbles overlapping. The bubble in front was a lawyer and the bubble behind was a little boy. So Byrne started with conceptualizing an intuition about a, pr uh, a professional role with a private childhood state behind it. Uh, 
And later, because he was a psychoanalyst, he develops his threefold model, but changed it not ego, uh, super ego, ego and it, but apparently uh, adult and child, and you know all that. <coughs> but if you don't uh, conceptualize a person uh, in, in the foreground, before the background of private personal history, there is no need to tie that together. So you you can, if you really work in the presence and uh, you focus on different worlds and dimensions in the present, uh, then you, you are totally free to define the functions you want to refer to. And you can use this uh, transactional model with the uh, open ladder model of functions. And it's it's very abstract. It's just mm -hmm. to be defined. Mm -hmm. I give you examples how it can be defined. For example, it can be defined uh, relating to the three world models. So uh, the question: uh, Am I acting in contact from my organizational role, from a role, from a role out of my professional world, or from a role? of my private world. And then you can uh, use all you know about transactions. You can say, official, I come from my organizational role, one. Maybe I'm the boss of a department. I say to my colleague, who is also a psychologist, this is the way I want the job have done. This is not psychology, this is hierarchy, yeah? mm. and the person at first answers as an employee, yes, so what resources do we have, what time do we have, uh, if we have uh, different priorities, what is the one that is valid here? Then I start to say, yes, this is a priority, we do not, um, let's say it's a training department, we do not fulfill any customer, customer's wish. We decide only to support customers to organize their own learning. We do not teach them. Yeah? And then the other person might uh, change without being aware of it into a professional perspective. Is that a good concept? Would I, from my psychological uh, profession, professional point of view decides the same and starts arguing with me and addressing my role as, also as a psychologist. And then we come into role co and encounter confusion. And it's so if the part of the transaction four that is directed to me, it's a crossed transaction in classical TA terms. And the question is, am I aware from which role I want to deal with that question? Or uh, let I myself be caught into a professional discourse? But this might be interesting. We can do that for some time. But at the end, that's the question, who decides which strategy is um, valid? That's a question of power, of organizational power uh, that is going along with organizational roles. It's not a question of pref uh, professional preferences. And <coughs> maybe underlying, uh, we might have a, a boy's game, as you, you said <laughs> that, uh, yesterday, so, that uh, on a private level, it's um, who of us is the brightest boy or the strongest boy or can uh, be superior to the other. This might be also an underlying background. And you certainly can use this functional model with different definitions, only within organizational roles. All people today have a portfolio of organizational roles. They are bosses, they are colleagues, uh, they are, uh, they are uh, in the role of serving other uh, departments. 
they can be also um, have a leader role in the cooperation of several departments. So there are many different roles with many different rules and perspectives on reality. So you also can say, okay, um, I am the head of a, a project several departments have to work on in this company. I'm also uh, somebody who is responsible for uh, developing products. And I'm um, an employee myself. And then when I talk to others, it's important that I know from which perspective I'm talking to them. And you all, you all know uh, communications uh, in organizations where everything is mixed up. After some time, nobody knows what we're really discussing, who has which kind of right to discuss. Uh, and you need the clarification of the roles from which you discuss in order to have a chance to come somewhere. This is where I think contracting and particularly multi-party contracting comes mm -hmm. into its own. Yes. Because something I've done a lot of is working with clinical leadership in the NHS. And the health service is going through a major change at the moment where people are starting to work as partners rather than in mm -hmm. the hierarchy. So, for example... Um, the role of consultant surgeon, the professional yeah. role, yeah. is completely and utterly different in the context of the organisation to how it ever has been before. Right. But a lot of the issues are still unnamed, yeah. so they're sitting at the psychological level. So I get contracted in as a consultant to work with, um, uh, let's say, a breakdown in communication between managers and clinical leads. Mm. What I discover in the in the consulting process, in the contracting process, is that I speak to the clinical lead in their organizational role, mm -hmm. they reply from their professional role. Right. So I, they speak as a surgeon, I speak to them as clinical lead. And this, uh, there's lots of cross transactions and then I find out that culturally, the fact that that role is complex, the role of clinical lead, and carries two an organizational and a professional role is excluded. The organizational role is excluded within the culture yeah. so that the status of surgeon is protected, but not explicitly. Mm -hmm. So then you get all these games, um, organizational games going on at mm -hmm. the psychological level, and then I get invited into a role I can't possibly deliver. Yeah. The fantastic thing about this is it gives me a language to map on the table yes. systemically um, my experience and the contaminations between roles mm -hmm. and the exclusions in a mm -hmm. way that people just go, oh, right. Mm -hmm. And then the conversation is, how do we talk about this? Mm -hmm. Rather than me getting bogged down in a contract yeah. I can't right. deliver. But the way, the reason I mentioned multi-party contracting is yeah. I don't think as a sole consultant in a system like that, I can I can un, I can surface these things mm -hmm. effectively. So what I've done is then created a situation where I have various stakeholders mm -hmm. within the system mm -hmm. who are also caught up in the exclusion to have that conversation. Yeah. Yeah. This is this is yeah. dynamite for that. Yeah. Experience. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. To me, it seems like a great model for accounting for things oh, in a yeah. way that you know you have that professional role. Yeah. We're not yeah. discounting that. That's still there. And you have this, and that's important to recognise mm -hmm. too. And I think it's, mm -hmm. yeah. it's quite liberating and quite... Mm. Yeah. And functionally, you, can, you can look at the transactions really practically and pragmatically and show people, yeah. and show yourself yes. as well, mm -hmm. what's happening. And the, the consequences of not clarifying roles and shared reality, mm -hmm. you can uh, deal with, with psychological methods, but the, it's not caused by psychological confusion, it's, uh, it's caused by role confusion and not clarifying realities and roles. Mm -hmm. So that's a danger if you are psychologically trained, you certainly yes. can observe psychological phenomenon, but it's not important to deal with them, because they will be produced endless as long role clarification doesn't uh, take place in the organization. And it's not only a question 
of clarifying roles, it's also a question of designing roles. Yes. Because a role is not a natural thing. In each com every company, uh, the, the attributes of roles might be different. So we need, uh, in the beginning when we work together, a clarification how we design each other's role that we understand what role we play in this play. And how they meet. Yes. And so for me, what came to mind is thinking about the last organization I worked within and how um, personally I was being asked to bring all my professional expertise and think for myself and make sure I was supporting the organization, being proactive, delivering everything. And everyone else was being asked very similar yeah. things. And then came at loggerheads when I was asked to just take on something. Yeah. And that came into conflict with the think for yourself, be professional, bring your expertise. Yeah, yeah. And if all I if I knew that in the contract what they were saying to me is now we just want you to be an employee. Yes. Yeah. It brings a different state of mind, a different frame of yeah. reference. Yeah. And it's it's not discounting my professional capability. It's right. simply saying right now we simply need you to be an employee not a coach, a facilitator, no right. deep consultant. Right. Mm -hmm. right. I was thinking about, Sandra, I think you mentioned um, management and trade unions yesterday, mm -hmm. and I was thinking about uh, this week, the education strike that's going to go on in schools. Mm -hmm. As tomorrow? Mm -hmm. um, it is an organisation, I mean, trade unions, it's talking about an organisational phenomenon, it's about pensions and all of right. that. And the response is often at the professional level. Mm -hmm. But you're leaving the children. What about the children? The children aren't getting learning, yeah. mm -hmm. what have you. But it's an organisational problem, yes. got, which is what a trade union is for, to represent the organisational level that people have in their professional roles right. that don't have the professional authority, mm -hmm. don't have the organisational yes. authority. Yes. Right. Yes. So that's the job of a trade union. But many trade union officials become very confused. Mm -hmm. So when they talk, and I was listening to somebody talk about the strike tomorrow, they suddenly started talking about, and this will help learning in the classroom. Yeah. It's like, no, it won't. It will help teachers' pensions when they've retired. Mm -hmm. It's got nothing to do with learning right. in the classroom. It's a different matter. <laughs> Wonderful. Wonderful <laughs> and there's also role fixation, I think, around trade unions as mm. well. Yeah. So there's still this sort of 60s, 70s mm. idea of what it means, and it's not... It's not in the here and now context. Right. right. And so, yeah. I think it's extremely powerful, the, the, the whole, whole thing that we've been uh, hearing to, today. Uh, in, a, in a context where, um, where I'm working, where people are coming from all over the Europe with their own uh, background and their own history and their own culture, and they have their own preferred roles which they want to play. And, um, how they get mixed up with the the play that is, is taking place. <laughs> right. So they don't they understand the pl the play, and they play their role, and then they are they are confused because things don't happen the way they want. Yeah. The the the, the reading of what yeah. the play is all about is 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 it's lost. Yeah, and um, this is a consequence of our naivety to think our reality is the reality of others. Yes. Yeah. And we, uh, we get notice that it's not true when we're in trouble. And my plenary is for being aware, do you remember this encounter, cultural mm -hmm. encounter model, that the first <coughs> thing to do is to make sure yeah, in basic definitions and understanding you have a shared reality. This means a shared understanding of roles, of important stages of the kind of story you're playing. And then you can start to play. And most people just start to play, expecting that it's happening as they know it, mm. and then they have a problem. So in Schiffian terms, you're talking about what exists and what's significant. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So I, I know that it's, it's a, the functional ladder model is difficult in that way because it's not saying you, this is a concept, this is defined like this, and you can do this and that with that. It's, it's defining a framework that helps you to use all your knowledge about transactions and confrontations and contracting and so on. 
but you have to define the uh, the steps in the ladder uh, related to your actual work and related to the difference that makes a difference. And if you do that, you do just what Eric Byrne did when he invented the ego state model. He had a problem, he thought about it, he used some kind of schema that was suitable to this problem and then a school developed out of it. But uh, as long as you are in this track, it's a good uh, way to use all these experience. But today you are in so many different roles and contexts and issues that you uh, it's important that you you use uh, the experiences by the figures and, and procedures and approaches how you can work them. But the definition of the of, of the functions you should invent each time appropriate mm -hmm. to the mm -hmm. situation you're working in. Mm -hmm. What you're essentially doing is defining the boundaries between right. each of the different worlds right. and really being explicit and contracting. Yeah, and making clear that you could not just adopt uh, a, a, a model of psychotherapy of the 1960s mm -hmm. to do organizational work mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm. But you can use many of the experiences how to deal with models like this, mm -hmm. but you have to adopt it and create a in extreme, you have to create for each situation your own new model. And you use framework, frames, and we are teaching frames here. It feels to me, and in my experience, that as a company evolves, it doesn't clearly define and communicate what its definition in, it, in its boundaries are. Yeah. Um, and that sometimes is where the confusion lies, and in parallel, the same things don't happen together. So yeah. as you evolve, you know, I need to communicate to you and these are the parameters and the boundaries that you need to work within yes. and we can then move together mm -hmm. and evolve together and that sometimes feels as if it's lacking. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. And isn't that also because individuals in the roles uh, get stuck in the last role? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So it's then role exclusion or role confusion. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and so it goes on over time. Because yeah. I know when I do projects, I'll say, where is the job description and what's the role? Have, have you clearly defined the role? Oh, no, we haven't got that because they've evolved, evolved so quickly yes. that mm -hmm. the two can't happen in parallel. Yeah, so they need a meta-competence mm -hmm. to, to dialogue on all these definitions over and over again, mm -hmm. what we call responsibility dialogue. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and I think that goes back to philosophy and, and if... The concept within an organization is that that's where you're going and this is where you are and then you have a linear process mm -hmm. that is hierarchically communicated mm -hmm. then it makes sense that roles become fixated and contaminated and excluded whereas if your your frame is that meaning emerges in the moment right. and is co-created right. then the whole way you talk about things yeah. would be different and you need a language yes to do that yes. and, and this is a contribution to the language yes. Um, so, f from the personality model, it's a short way to a comp competence model. So, classical personal personality work in TA says uh, you are bound by biography, bi biography and by limits and patterns of biography you have learned. So, we free you from that and then you are competent. That's a naive idea. Uh, you have to be trained uh, to be competent. And sometimes, uh, if you are well trained to be competent, your neurosis from biography is not interesting. And it's not coming into the foreground, it's not even working as background. Because your whole soul and energy is occupied with competent here and now work. So, enhancing competence is psychotherapy. If you really can do your professional jobs and know who you are professionally today, that's very healing because it, it, you, you turn into other fields of your life than of your burdened biography. It 
if it was burdened. And if you always work with the burdens of your biography, hoping that if they are finished, then you are competent today, that's just not true. And competence, uh, we have a Wiesloch formula, somebody called it that way, and I adopted that. Um, this ma is making clear that uh, competence is not only the transactional competence in specific contexts. Yeah? Competence means role competence, and you need for each role different competences, different bundles of competences, understand the, the play in which this role is played, and so on. So, and if you don't know how to play a role, uh, you can't feel good and make good work. And then you get into psychological trouble, and then you can't make psychotherapy, but this will not help you to learn your role. Might be the better psychotherapy is to learn your role. Or not playing a role you, you, you are not able to play, or not talented to play. So it's a role competence, and it's, a co it's also the context competence, the competence in the professional field. Somebody might be an excellent leader, that's a role, within a small social group, but is not able to be a leader in a big company. It's a different world. Mm -hmm. So context competence, to understand the play. If you don't, on the stage, understand the play, how it is meant to be played, then it doesn't help that you can play one of the roles perfectly, but you don't understand how to fit that in, in the play. So, and maybe you're not so good in playing the role, but you understand very well the play, you quickly learn your role in the context. Mm -hmm. And what companies often do, if people do not function very well in the context, they send them to training. This is like uh, like a, an actor school, but if the play is is not good or nobody is here to help you to understand the play, it's no solution that you go back to the actor school. And we have many in our groups uh, who want to have a service as actor and not a service to understand the play they are in. Yes, yeah. and I think also I speak from experience here. I think. Um, sometimes there is a play inside the play, mm. like yeah. in Shakespeare's comedies. Mm. Yes. So you don't know that you are in the play inside the play. Right. You think you're in the play. Yes. Yeah. But actually, you're in the play inside the play. Right. So context, uh, systemically uh, understood, is not a fixed thing. You have, for this issue we are talking about, which are the contexts we need to include to understand what we want to understand. And certainly one version is playing on the play. And if, if the person understands the play within uh, his team, but doesn't understand that the stress on that team is coming from a, a bigger play in the company, then it's a, a too narrow horizon for trying to understand on improving learning. And then it's your job as a supervisor to say, uh, to, to have context competence yourself. You must just be experienced in knowing which kind of contexts are important for which kind uh, of learning and situations. And if you are not competent on that, you cannot be a trainer for organizational people. Mm -hmm. It's not that you have to know everything, but you uh, you have to account for the importance to ask these questions. Mm -hmm. And if you don't know yourself, and the other person doesn't know either, to think how can we find out mm -hmm. which horiz horizons are important to understand what we have to do and to learn here. And that's so common, isn't it, with learning and development departments? They are caught up in their own play within the play, yes. learning yes. and development, yes. rather than what the actual yes. organisation plays. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. And then people are invited in as external trainers and coaches yeah. who participate in this play within the play. Yes. 
and it's meaningless. Yeah, yeah. all in, in, in a specific uh, reality bubble, but it's yeah. not the bubble that's affecting the reality, the things they affect. Yeah. yeah. And uh, here uh, networks and colloquial exchange and associations come in. They should make clear, we do it in the coaching association to the coach, it's not enough that you do competent coaching with individuals yeah. for a company that is producing coaching issues endless. You can you can do that if you need the money and sometimes it's really good service to an individual. But we as an association stand for 50% for the efforts to understand how the organizational development should happen that coaching is unnecessary at that amount we have now. Yes. Yeah. And so that's also an ethical position. Yes. And, um, and, and this is why we need organizational and professional culture for, association culture for. And many associations today that came from the history of psychotherapy, even if they understood that we have different application fields, uh, they, they develop uh, additional fields, but they do not integrate them into their theory and self-understanding as an association. What is? It's not an easy thing to do. I, maybe it's better to let these associations die, die and uh, found new associations who are uh, clearly focused, for example, for the organizational field, but diverse concerning the approaches. It might be TA and, organi uh, and group dynamics and that and the, the professional self-definition is on what kind of client systems we work with and on what kind of uh, questions we are focused on. And we do not define ourselves by we have an ego state model that we will try everywhere. <laughs> So, this, the third part is the matching. I made the example with the leader. If, if my cell calls for a small team and not so hard business, but more sensible human-oriented uh, uh, performance of a team, then the matching to a small team might be wonderful. And if, I, 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 if I'm a wonderful leader here, they call me to be a leader in a company maybe, and it's not matching. It, I, I might learn to match it, but it might also be that I will never learn it because it doesn't fit to me. And we work on this matching question with the inner images to find out what is the landscape of my soul and what are the landscape of the fields I'm working in and where is it corresponding or not. Matt, how do you relate this notion of soul Role. Let's say it's an essential quality in how I play roles. Okay. And I have here this times sign. This is a metaphor for saying uh, if your context competence is low, it doesn't make sense to learn more roles better because you cannot play better when you do not understand the play you are in. And it's also a question of economy. If your understanding of the play is going to zero, it's no effect when you go with your role competence from 60% to 90%. It will in the end still be zero. And vice versa. So it's also a schema to discuss with a candidate for your groups what the person needs to learn in order really to get better. And very often it's most more important to understand the context and the field than to learn to know, uh, to, to, to play roles better. Classical transactional analysis and exams have been totally focused on learning roles better and shaping communication. But many uh, competence uh, very often has to do the understanding the place. And we do not slowly develop the rituals to focus on that in exams. 
But still, with the tapes, for example, the main question is, what is this transaction? What are you, how are you, what um, ego state you're addressing as the other person? How does the person react? Do you realize that there's a cross transaction? And so on. And this, this is all fine, but for a modern, open-minded professionality in all fields, that's too narrow. And the matching. If it doesn't make sense to your soul, you can uh, know your roles and you can uh, know the place. You will not build up a, a power field. And this is why I, I, I left many of many stages and roles. I know them, but I was fed up with it. Mm -hmm. My soul wasn't interested in, in doing it anymore. I've just been wondering if that's why um, some people choose to become independent as consultants. They don't like the play they're in mm -hmm. once they discover what it is. Yes. And there is something about being independent and working for many organizations yes. which you can both helicopter but also see a variety yes. of different places. They have my choices. It's easier to see the place yeah. when you're outside. And there's still a danger in it. Uh, it, yes. it can be that they have only one tool and they try it everywhere and it's a fashionable tool they use it everywhere but then they are caught in another trap they are caught in a one tool professionality and so no matter what you do you have to be aware of all the dimensions of professionality and sometimes if your soul is intrigued, you may not know the role very well, and you may not understand the play very well, but you still have power. Mm. And uh, in my case, I, I can uh, observe in different stages, I'm enthusiastic, my soul is intrigued, but I'm not understanding everything very well, but I have a quite good effect. Then I learn to understand things very well, but my, my soul said, that's okay, go on, but it's not enthusiastic. And then there, the performance is also quite good. And then there's a point, I know almost everything I need to know, but my soul is bored. Mm -hmm. And then the performance is going down, and uh, when I'm lucky, I've built up new stages and new roles and new issues my soul loves to be in. And if not, I have a problem. I go on and go on and go on. We all know teachers and psychotherapists who are, and consultants who are caught in a business that uh, is yawning for their soul. And if they are unlucky, it's a fashionable business and it's paid very well. So mm -hmm. they, they are corrupt. They do it, go on doing it, doing That's it. That's what's happened with my sister. She hates her job. Yeah. Mm. Hates what she does. And she's really good at it. And she gets paid well for it. Yes. And she won't move out of it because she's so good at it. Yeah. And she gets paid well for it. And she gets recognition. Yes. Mm. And she hates it. And she doesn't <laughs> she doesn't pay the price to satisfy her soul. Yeah. Mm. Like trapped. Yeah. 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 So, concerning profession, it's matching with the soul uh, and, and with meaning in life. And uh, concerning organizations, there are a lot other things. We have to find out whether it matches, cultures match with my personality culture, whether I like to travel or not, whether I like to wear ties or not, whether I like to be quite technical, controllable in my work, or whether I'm not. And we have to find out whether uh, the needs of an organization, the culture of an organization, and my personal culture match. And idealistic, the culture of the organization must have space for development from my personal culture. Then I'm intrigued really to do a job there. And sometimes people become to feel unsatisfied, they don't know why. And then we do this in our images work to find out that this, uh, which are the dimensions in which the soul is getting tired. So depression mm -hmm. is when there is not sufficient match. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
and they do not know how to, to handle it or, or how to move. And sometimes you do not know where to move. Uh, uh, and you need, and with the theater metaphor, you give them a language to think about in, uh, on, in which dimensions they have the wish to move. And then they can find out whether this is possible in this company or not. And it, sometimes it's much more possible when they know what, where they want to know, move, they can bargain on something. If they come to bargain and say, I want to be more myself at work, or um, the others do not understand what you mean. If they say, I, I, I want to be more on big stages, do you believe I can play there? Or I want reduce to be on small stages, but doing more qualified works there and not losing money by changing. Is that possible here? Mm. Yeah. Then you have a language and to understand yourself and the language to tell the other people what you are bargaining with them. And so the quality of, of dialogues will improve by this. Okay. So. Uh. We had said already, competence is uh, not a property only of a person, but of a system. You are competent in a system, that's always being aware of contents. We already did that, role competence, context competence. Yeah, that's just what we already said. The matching. We can hear later more about matching. Uh, there are questions from two directions. What we learn is the question, does this organization fit to me? What you do not love so much, uh, uh, does this organization make sense to me? What we do not like so much is the question from the perspective of the organization. Does this person make sense for the organization? And certainly it should be vice versa, and we should discuss about that. And, and then we will have a break. The matching system cycle circle looks like this. It's a graphic. Uh, in order to have matching dialogues, the person needs to know who, who am I as an individual? What is my core self-understanding as a professional? And what, within that frame, what are my core competencies? And then, if I... I'm aware of that, then I, I'm prepared to look for a function in an organization that's calling for these competencies. But it's not difficult to find a, a company that uh, has a qualified discussion with me about that, because it it's, um, depends on the maturity of the company, on knowing what, what they want on their functions. So. On the other side of professional self-positioning, there is the organizational positioning. The organization should be clear about what their core business is, what, for what they are in the world, and their core business, and what is the core process they need to maintain and develop to stay on this business, and from that what are core roles and what are um, additional roles we need and, and defines the functions from knowing what is needed. And then, and, and what qualities of the role player do we need to fulfill this function in our company? This has to do with our style, with our market, with our relevant others. And then we can talk about whether we match to each other or not. This is ideal. Certainly we never have this completely, but it's a perspective from which we think, how much do we know now about this or that? From what we know, how would we try to find a position? And would this match? And then uh, we have a quite well-organized discussion that should not be too much analytic and controlling, but leave much space for our intuition to work during the conversation. That's what contracting is to me. Yeah, that's So, well. it's the contracting for me is that space in the middle 
where the two realities yes. come together, and <coughs> each part, each person or role, each role within that will have a, a way of articulating their reality at that time. Yeah. But everybody has to be prepared to co-create something, yes. including the consultant. Yes. And and that to me is is the joy of the of the job. Yeah. And if if you enter an organisation where um, there is a fixation about mm. what the consultant's role is at that particular time right. and it doesn't fit, that's okay. But we have to be clear about whether we enter right. that arena or not. Right. But to me, to go in with an open mind and and hear how that reality is put together yes. by the client, that's yeah. that's that, so for me. That space is empty yeah. in the middle. And as an organization, if you meet a, a consultant who has uh, is obviously competent and has yes. an idea how to shape roles and responsibilities and yes. functions differently, yes. I think about changing my role system in order to give this person a place. Exactly. But we know what we do. Exactly. And not it's just saying, oh yeah, you are good, you will know what you do, and still staying with my old role models, and exactly. after some time we have a problem together. Good break. Good break. Good break. Good break. Good break. Good break.